from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming to our Books and Beyond program today. I'm Guy Molinar from the Center for the Book, and we're co-sponsoring this program today with the Manuscript Division. Uh, if you don't know about the Center, we're a small division of the Library of Congress that promotes books, reading, libraries, and literacy, and we administer two other parts of the library, which is the Young Readers Center, which is a fairly new center in the library in the Jefferson Building that's for kids 16 and under, and we also oversee the Poetry and Literature Center, which just named a new poet laureate, Juan Felipe Herrera. Additionally, we administer the Library of Congress Literacy Awards, and we'll be announcing the winners of those awards this fall. We carry out our mission nationwide, and we do that with the assistance of affiliated centers for the book. We have 52 of those, one in every state, one in D.C., and we even have one most recently in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So I urge you to go to the U.S. Virgin Islands <laughs> on your next vacation and visit the Center for the Book. Um, we also have a partnership with 80 like-minded organizations that promote literacy nationwide. And we play an important role in the National Book Festival, which this year is Saturday, September 5th at the Washington Convention Center. Um, we have more than 150 authors coming this year. And if you go to our website at loc.gov slash bookfest, you can see all the great authors who are coming this year. Um, before we get started, could you please turn off all your electronic devices? And I need to let you know that we're recording this event. So if you ask a question, you will become a part of the webcast. Those webcasts, by the way, are available on our website, which is read.gov. And you can find more than 200 discussions there from authors uh, covering all genres of writing. Um, today's author's book is for sale over there at, on the at the end of our room there, and it will be sold at a discount, and the author will be there signing the book as well, so it's another chance to uh, talk to the author and ask her any questions you might have. Um, the chief criterion that we have for this Books and Beyond series is that the book has to have a strong connection to the Library of Congress, and in most cases, that means that the writer did research today. Today's author researched her book in the Manuscript Division, as I said, they're co-sponsoring today. And with us from the Manuscript Division is Laura Kells, who is the Senior Archives Specialist in the Preparation Section of the Division. Currently, she is working on organizing the papers of Lee Strasberg. Um, if you don't know that name, he was the founder of the Actors Studio, which worked with such notable actors as Marlon Brando, Marilyn Monroe, and James Dean. So could you please welcome Laura Kells, who will introduce our speaker. I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Laura Riccio, who has returned to the Library of Congress to speak to us about her new book, The Marquis, Lafayette Reconsidered. The story of why I'm doing the introduction begins almost 60 years ago. In 1956, a front page story in the New York Times announced that a cache of papers belonging to the Marquis de Lafayette had just been discovered by his descendant, the Count René de Chambrun, after he acquired La Grange, Lafayette's 15th century chateau loca located 30 miles east of Paris. Forty years later, in 1995, the Librarian of Congress, James Billington, signed an agreement with the Count de Chambrun to microfilm these papers and make them available for research in the reading room in the library's manuscript division. Between July 1995 and February 1996, small groups of library staff made four trips to France to oversee the microfilming of these papers on site in the chateau. I was part of this project and spent 10 weeks working at Lagrange. I'm a processing archivist who, who usually works behind the scenes and rarely get to see people doing research in the collections. So I was thrilled when in about 2010, I was substituting for a reference librarian in the reading room and noticed a woman working diligently at the microfilm and she was using the Lafayette microfilm. When my shift was over, she was still there, so I thought I'd, I'd stop by and mention that I work on the project 
and say I was glad she was using the microfilm and to check to see if there was anything I could possibly help her with. So I went up to her and I said, excuse me. And she threw her arms up in the air and she said, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I quickly reassured her and she said her reaction was the result of a recent research trip to France. <laughs> She told me she was working on a, a, bi a biography of Lafayette, and it turned out that she was interested in talking with me. So that's how I met Laura Riccio. I learned that she's a specialist in 18th century French history and art, who received her undergraduate degree from Harvard University and her PhD from Columbia University. Her background in art strongly influences her work as a biographer. She is currently dean of undergraduate studies in the New School in New York. I caught up with Laura when she returned to the library on subsequent research trips and was thrilled when she made a trip to Lagrange so we could compare notes. There are very few people with whom I can discuss Lafayette's desk chair. <laughs> uh, Laura worked for, spent seven years working on this biography. And here it is. Uh, the, the Marquis Lafayette Reconsidered is an engrossing and richly illustrated portrait of Lafayette's life and his role in both American history and French history. She begins by pondering why Lafayette is such an admired figure in America, but not in France, and then proceeds to explain how and why this came to pass. So please welcome Laura Riccio. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's the microfilm. I don't know what that is. I'll ignore that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, I have to say, I'm glad that Laura told that story um, rather than me, uh, because it is one of the more embarrassing moments of my life. But uh, but I, I have I, I have done most of my research in France and in French archives and in the Bibliothèque Nationale. And I have to say that on a daily basis, I would generally wake up and wonder what I was going to do wrong that day. Um, <laughs> And so I have to say that Laura, um, Laura and her colleagues here at the Library of Congress actually persuaded me through their simple generosity and kindness that I should actually henceforth work only on American topics, or at least topics, <laughs> <laughs> or at least on topics that can, be, uh, that, that can be researched here at the Library of Congress because it was an incomparable experience. So, so thank you, Laura. Um, I also just want to take a moment to, um, to honor the memory of Karen Stewart, who is one of Laura's colleagues who also went with her um, to Lagrange, and um, she also, we also uh, spoke several times. She shared postcards that she had with me. She collected some postcards of Lagrange and to do with Lafayette, and she shared those pictures with me. We had lunch a couple of times here, and she sadly passed away not too long before the book came out, I don't think. So um, I was very sorry not to be able to share the completed book with her because she too was extremely lovely and helpful to work with. So thank you all. So, <coughs> excuse me. So as Laura said, um, my book begins, and I'm going to start in the same way that I started the book. Um, my book begins with a little anecdote, <coughs> which took place in, in uh, April of uh, 2009. And as an art historian, when I start working on a project, what I usually do is I start looking at the visual and material culture of that topic, whatever it is. And so it was natural that um, when I started working on Lafayette, that I wanted to go and see the various busts and sculptures and caricatures and paintings and many, many items of material culture that we have about Lafayette. So I made an appointment at Versailles to go to see this bust, which is actually a very important bust by an important French uh, neoclassical sculptor named Jean-Antoine Houdon. And um, I, so I made an appointment at Versailles, and I went to Versailles, and um, I was speaking with uh, the curator of sculpture, and I had to make an appointment to see this work because it wasn't on view. Well, when I got to the curator's office, what I discovered was that he wasn't overjoyed to see me. Um, <laughs> in fact, um, he seemed sort of annoyed because I had to take him, um, it turned out, in order to see this bus. We had to leave the main building. We had to walk a through the rain, across cobblestones, to find um, a small room that had clearly not been used in much of a while. And um, he was carrying a very large ring of 
antique keys. And he was sort of muttering as he was walking. He was trying to figure out which key was the one that was going to open this door. So finally, we got there. And he opened the door and flipped on the light. And there was a fine film of dust over, over everything. And um, I was admiring this bust. And all of a sudden, he said, why should we have a bust of Lafayette? Now, he said it in French, so I thought that I had perhaps misunderstood. So I said, pardon? And um, he repeated the question louder and slower. <laughs> so I said, yes, I, I understand. Um, and I started to tell him, naively perhaps, um, I started to explain to him that Lafayette had been only 19 years old when he had volunteered to serve in George Washington's army, that um, he had come over here and uh, he had frozen with the troops at Valley Forge, and he had been very influential in persuading the French government to come out in open support of the American cause. And these are some of the reasons why we have a bust of Lafayette. And he was distinctly not impressed. <laughs> um, and uh, he gestured towards a, um, hello, pup. Sorry, I, I'm a dog person. Um, he gestured towards a, uh, towards a, a plaque that was installed a few feet away. And this was a bronze plaque that was commemorating the thousands of French soldiers and sailors who had come to fight in the American Revolution, many of whom had lost their lives. And he said, well, you Americans, you insist on, a, on, on worshiping Lafayette, but you don't know the names of any of these other people who died. And he said, moreover, it wasn't Lafayette. It was Rochambeau who led the French forces. And you know, some Americans know Rochambeau, but you're not crazy about Rochambeau the way you are about Lafayette. <laughs> and, and he said, and it was Louis XVI, in fact, bankrupted his country for, for, for your revolution. And he got his thanks on the guillotine. And nobody has any sculptures of him. And, <laughs> and so I sort of had to admit that the man had a point, um, that this was an interesting question of why is it that we have a bust of Lafayette? Um, and then I became interested in the second question, which is, why don't they have busts of Lafayette in France? Or, or really, why is he not such a hero in France as he is here? And just to give you a, a sort of a, a preview of an answer, this is one of the kinder caricatures um, of Lafayette from the period of the French Revolution. And it describes him, as you can see, as quite literally two-faced. On the one hand, a man of the people, and on the other hand, a man of the court. And the reason for this is that Lafayette belonged to a group of liberal nobility who believed that what France needed was a constitutional monarchy. He did not believe that France could or should sustain an American-style republic. And he did not believe that the monarchy should remain as it, as it had been, as an absolute monarchy. Instead, he wanted a reformed monarchy. And in the process of, um, of really adhering to this middle of the road position, he ultimately lost the faith of both sides, which is part of the reason why uh, there is, in fact, no, why Lafayette is not so widely heroized in France today. So to begin to answer the curator's question then, why do we have a bust of Lafayette? Well, in part, we have a bust of Lafayette partially because Lafayette wanted us to. His American reputation, as I'm going to discuss today, was actually one of the things that he cherished the most and that he went out of his way to burnish constantly. Um, and the other part is that he, in fact, uh, came to America like many of my ancestors, at least, in part to reinvent himself. He came here in part to become a new person. Now, it might seem strange. I'm showing you here uh, on the right-hand side, you see an image of the Hotel de Noailles, which is where he was living when uh, he came to America. Now, it might seem strange that a person who was living in such a place would want to leave and reinvent himself. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to discuss that very briefly. But so this is the Hotel de Noailles. It no longer exists. But you can see on the left where it stood in Paris. Uh, that's the general vicinity. It stood very near the Tuileries Palace, which is no longer there. The Tuileries Garden is there. And actually, I'll just point over here. It's, it's this area over here. Um, and the Louvre Palace is here. This hotel, the Hotel de Noailles, was very, very close to the royal palaces because the Noailles family was very, very close to the court. They were very influential at the court of Louis XV. Now, Lafayette had not been born into this family. He had married into this family. And that made all the difference because the place where he came from was a very different place. Uh, the place he came from was here. And uh, as you can see, this is the Auvergne, which is this area here. 
It's several hundred miles south of um, several hundred miles south of Paris, and what you're seeing on the top uh, on the top is the Chateau of Chavagnac, where he was uh, born and raised, and on the bottom is a photo that I took, uh, just showing the surroundings of his of his chateau. Um, the, in this area, his family was pretty much the sum total of the local elite. He remembers telling, he tells stories in his memoirs about how people would travel for miles and miles and miles across this, this very craggy terrain to consult with his grandmother. And he also talks about uh, a, an eye-opening moment when he went to Paris for the first time, and he was surprised to see that the men he passed along the route did not remove their hats in deference to him. So. In the Auvergne, he had been sort of the, the cream of the crop. Um, but to give you a sense of what this place was like, uh, today, has anyone ever been to the Auvergne? It's, it's, it's very, how do you describe it? Rustic? Rustic. 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 Mountainous. Mountainous. Beautiful. So today we appreciate the rustic beauty of this mountainous area. But in the 18th century, the rusticity was less widely uh, appreciated, I think, is a good way to put it. So um, just to give you an example, I have a wonderful little quote from an English agronomist named Arthur Young, who traveled through the area in 1789. Now, as an English agronomist, he disliked much of what he saw in France. But um, he particularly reserved particular uh, disdain for the Auvergne and for its capital. So just to give you a little flavor, uh, he, he, Arthur Young, wrote of Clermont that it is, quote, in the midst of a most curious country, all volcanic, and is built and paved with lava. Much of it forms one of the worst built, dirtiest, and most stinking places I have met with. <laughs> but he wasn't done. There are, he, there are, he wrote, many streets that can, for blackness, dirt, and ill scent, only be represented by narrow channels cut in a night dunghill. <laughs> so needless to say, this was a place that Lafayette loved dearly, but it was not a fashionable place to call home. Um, and had all gone according to plan, he would have lived out his life in and around this area, except for when he went to war. And he might well have been killed on a battlefield as his father had been before him. His father had died before he was two years old, before Lafayette was two years old. His father had died uh, killed by an English cannonball at the Battle of Minden in the Seven Years' War, which we call here the French and Indian War. Um, but through a series of happenstances of uh, good marriages and early deaths in his family, he found himself rather abruptly in a very different situation. And in 1774, he was an orphan, he was 17 years old, and he was one of France's wealthiest men outside of the Princes of the Blood. And he was presented in 1774 at the Court of Versailles, which you see at the bottom. And he was married to the 15-year-old Adrienne de Noailles, whose family was very, very closely connected to court. So as you can see on the top is Chavagnac, and on the bottom is Versailles. Um, Lafayette's prestige at Chavagnac did not count for very much at all at Versailles. In fact, there he was rather an outsider. He was um, an awkward provincial. He didn't have the right accent. Um, he just himself wrote in his memoirs that, um, what did he say? He said, he said that the gaucheness of my manners, which without being out of place on any important occasion, never yielded to the graces of the court or the charms of supper in the capital. In other words, Versailles was a place where there were very particular rules of etiquette. There were very particular, precise things that one did and didn't do and said and didn't say. And Lafayette didn't know what they were because he wasn't from there. He was from a very, very different world. Um, and apparently, it was not false modesty that he was describing in his memoirs. We have the memoirs of um, a Belgian nobleman who was a friend of Marie Antoinette, a man named the Comte de Lamarck, who uh, spoke of Lafayette. And, and he described, and these are damning traits that I'm about to, to describe. He said that Lafayette, quote, danced without grace <laughs> and, and sat badly on his horse. So these were, these were things that one did not do if one were a member of this particular Oates society. Um, and in fact, there was one apparently terribly embarrassing moment for Lafayette when he was invited to one of the dances that Marie Antoinette sponsored regularly, and he proved himself to be so maladroit that uh, the queen could not stop herself from laughing. So he was clearly unsuited to the life of a courtier. 
Um, and he, in fact, uh, his in-laws nonetheless persisted in trying to get him a place at court. They wanted to get him a place in the entourage of, king, uh, of the brother of the king. And um, he then proceeded to insult the brother of the king, um, which he said he did intentionally in order to spare himself an inglorious life. Because the life that he envisioned for himself was a life of military glory. And um, things would have gone according to plan had it not been that in the spring of 1776, uh, the French army was actually undergoing a major reform because they had lost very, very badly to the English in the Seven Years' War. And so there was a, a, new, a new broom was sweeping clean within the army, and they were removing all of the men, men who, like Lafayette, had risen through the ranks through wealth and connections, but had never actually stepped foot on a battlefield. And so Lafayette, in June of 1776, found himself suddenly... Um, in the army reserves. He was removed from active duty. So he was casting about with not much to do in Paris. Into this mix in the summer of 1776 happened to arrive a group of Americans. Uh, Franklin, I'm fudging a little, Franklin came a couple of months later. But Silas Dean and other Americans, followed by Franklin, arrived in Paris. And suddenly, America was all the rage. In the summer of 1776, um, Everybody who is anybody in Parisian society wanted to have something to do with America. I'm showing you this portrait of Franklin because uh, many museums and historical societies and even individuals I've met around the country have versions of this. And the reason there are so many versions of this is because everybody in Paris wanted Franklin above their mantelpiece. So that this artist, Duplessis, actually made something of a cottage industry of portraits of Franklin. And... Um, the American cause was so popular that Marie Antoinette wanted Narragansett horses for her stables because she wanted to have a sort of American flair. The uh, French Haute Society renamed the English card game Whist. They named it Le Boston um, in, in honor of, um, in, in honor, it's true, I know, it's true. It doesn't sound it, but it is. Um, so, um, so, and meanwhile, Silas Dean, who was a Connecticut merchant who'd been sent to Paris, and he'd been sent there really in order to uh, to bring back several uh, engineers, because the army here needed engineers, and he'd also been asked to help with some armaments and so forth. Um, what he ended up finding was that there were scores and scores of French officers who had been removed from the military who wanted to sail for America, because they were all yearning to, um, to, to get back at the British. So, um, to be honest, the French government was looking the other way while a lot of these men were coming. The French government was not yet ready to break its truce with England. Um, they did not want to come out in open support, but they were perfectly happy for people to come over and start sort of helping, um, re helping relieve Britain of her colonies, uh, shall we say. Um, but Lafayette was so closely connected to court through his family that the king did not want him to come because it was going to be too big a deal if he came, and it was going to be evident that the king had sort of condoned this. So he was forbidden to come. However, he was, as I mentioned, an orphan and extremely wealthy, and frankly, he had nothing to lose, really. And so what he did was he purchased his own ship, and he came. Um, now, when he arrived, to be completely honest, uh, George Washington was not entirely certain what to do with him. Uh, he was 19 years old, and he had been given the rank of Major General, and he had never fought a day in battle. And George Washington writes this wonderful letter to Congress in which he says, what the intentions of Congress are with regard to the Marquis de Lafayette, I know no more than the child unborn. Um, he says, Washington says, there seems to be a difference of opinion here. Washington believed that Lafayette's title was meant to be merely honorary, because how could it be otherwise? Um, but Lafayette was young and eager and enthusiastic, and he fully expected to be placed in command. So he was just ready to be, you know, placed in command and sent out to do something glorious. And um, Washington was really not certain about this. So um, a letter arrives from, in, in late, in August, a letter arrives from Benjamin Franklin that says basically to Washington, listen, this is what he wants. He says, Franklin says, Lafayette is very, very wealthy and his family is very well connected. What he wants, says Franklin, is he wants an opportunity to win a bit of glory. So please do me a favor, find an opportunity for him to be hazarded, not much, <laughs> but where he can win a bit of glory. So Washington has such an opportunity at hand. So um, 
The Battle of Brandywine is coming up. The British are marching towards Philadelphia, which they will eventually take. And on September 11th of 1777, the Battle of Brand this is the Brandywine River that you see here. And well, you can tell the British are in red and the, the Americans are in blue. And um, as you can see at the bottom, there's a direct route to Philadelphia um, at an area that's called Chad's Ford. And that's where sort of near where Washington um, has placed himself and, and his troops down there. And what Washington imagined was that uh, he fully expected that since that's the most direct route to Philadelphia, that's where the British would attack. So he placed himself there and he was engaged for about half the day with, um, with, with what turned out to be half the British forces. Um, what he did was he sent Lafayette up there. I don't know if you can see, but on the upper right, on the upper right hand side, Lafayette was up there with General Sullivan. Um, so kind of as far away as he could be from where Washington expected the brunt of the action to happen. Um, still on the battlefield, but sort of where he thought that he would be relatively safe. Well, as you can see from the red boxes uh, on the right, that actually um, Washington was surprised and uh, the other half of the British army uh, came down there and Lafayette, instead of being out of harm's way, was instead in the thick of the action. So Lafayette was actually wounded at the Battle of Brandywine. He was wounded in the leg. He was wounded, apparently, he says this himself, and by everything I've read, it seems to be true. He was wounded while trying to rally the troops who were retreating. And he was telling them, no, 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 we can do this. Let's get back out there. And he got shot in the leg. So he was 19, right? And he, he was 19, and he just had all of the enthusiasm and faith of a 19-year-old. Um, so... Uh, he was wounded, and Washington still imagined that this was all that he wanted. It's not a dire wound, but enough to merit the attentions of Washington's personal surgeon. And Washington then ended up writing a dispatch that went into all of the Patriot papers, which indicated um, that the Battle of Brandywine had been lost, and it mentioned only two names, and one of them was Lafayette, and saying that the Marquis de Lafayette had been wounded. So Lafayette's name was introduced to the American public as the French Marquis, who had um, shed blood on behalf of the American cause. Now again, Washington, Franklin, everybody expected that Lafayette would sort of take this moment and then go home. But he didn't. Instead, what he did was um, he decided that, okay, if he was wounded and had to spend some time in recovery, he was going to make himself useful in whatever other way he could find. Um, because he was determined that this was going to be his contribution to the world, really. So um, he was uh, recovering with the Moravian Brethren in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and he starts writing letters to both sides, to both the French and the Americans. He starts writing to the French saying, don't believe anything you hear about the Americans losing. It's not true. They're going to they're gonna come right back. Don't you fear. Don't lose faith. He's writing to all the Americans saying, the French are going to be here any moment. They're going to come out and open support. Don't you worry. And he's writing to both sides. And he makes himself into the really the prime sort of emissary or go-between representative between France and America. And he becomes the sort of living embodiment of the French-American alliance, which had, which had yet to become an actual thing. But Lafayette sort of forced it into being, um, sort of through his own sheer will. So when he recovered... And it turned out he wasn't planning to go back to France. Washington was actually seriously impressed. And um, Washington really took him under his wing. And Washington had been, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, Washington uh, had no biological children of his own. And Lafayette had been, a, um, had been orphaned at a very young age. And they developed a relationship that has very rightly been called a, a sort of father-son relationship. And Washington um, eventually did reward Lafayette within a couple of months um, with, with, a, with his own command. And he takes him under his wing, and he really starts mentoring him. And if you start read the, if you read the letters, if you read the orders that Lafayette give, uh, that Washington gives, mostly his orders tend to be very clipped as military orders are wont to be. But in the case of Lafayette, he writes these very long descriptive explanations about what he wants him to do and why he wants him to do it. And he's really tutoring him as he goes along. And Lafayette really starts to learn. So Lafayette becomes actually a very valued member of Washington's military family. Um, until uh, it turns out that um, news arrives finally that in fact the French are going to join the American cause um, when the Treaty of, um, of Amity and Commerce is signed. And at that point, uh, Lafayette decides that what he's going to do is he's going to go back to France. And what he wants to do is he wants to go back to France and he wants to return from France 
as a French soldier. He wants to come back, in fact, not just as a French soldier, he wants to come back at the head of the French forces. Now, again, he's, he's had a couple of months under his belt now, but, um, but the, the French are not necessarily looking to place him in, um, in such an exalted role. But Lafayette's strongest argument for coming back at the head of the French forces is his close friendship with Washington. And what I'm showing you here is a portrait of Washington that, uh, that Lafayette saw um, at John Hancock's house in Boston. Lafayette then had copies made and he brought, um, he had copies made both here and again in France and he uh, brought them with him and really made sort of a big deal about them when he got back to France. So for example, the painting on the left, which is a version, um, a, 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 a painting loosely based on the, on the Peel original, describes, um, he, Lafayette decides that he's going to bring this with him to a 4th uh, of July party that Benjamin Franklin is having. Um, and then he writes to the Comte de Vergen and in, in the French minister, and he says, uh, you know, if you're interested in uh, knowing what my friend looks like, come to my house and see his picture. So he's really emphasizing how close he is to Washington. And he has on the right is a, a, a print um, which says of Washington, which says on the bottom that it's made after an original that belongs to the Marquis de Lafayette. And this is sold throughout Paris, and Lafayette's name and Washington's become very, very entwined. Well, as it happens, of course, um, the French government decides that they're not going to put Lafayette in command. Instead, as my curator friend mentioned, they're going to place Ro Rochambeau, who is much, much more experienced, in command. But they do agree that they'll send Lafayette back to be the one to carry the news. Um, and so this is the ship. Uh, this is a recreation of the ship um, on which Lafayette returns to carry the news in 1780. This is the Hermione. Um, this, was, this was the Hermione while she was still uh, in the process of being reconstructed at Rochefort in, in France. And this is the ship that was just here in D.C. Uh, last week? This week? Still, no, it's in Annapolis now. She's making her way up. I was, uh, I was on her in Yorktown, and she's making her way up to Castine, Maine. And she's stopping all the way up um, on, at many, 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 many stops. So you can still catch her in Annapolis and then Baltimore, which is also not too far, and then Philadelphia, New York, Greenport, Newport, Boston, Castine. I think that's it. Um, so Lafayette returns on the ship, the Hermione, and carries with him the news that, um, that the French are coming out in open support and that they're sending troops and they're sending ships and they're sending money and they're sending arms, they're sending clothing, they're sending all the things that, that the Americans very, very, very badly need at this point in the war. Um, so Lafayette returns uh, in the service of General Washington. He plays actually a very important role in the Virginia campaign, the siege of Yorktown, which is the final major hostilities of the American Revolution. And when he returns to France, um, he returns as... Washington's friend, and he returns as the man who really embodied French-American friendship and really embodied the French-American alliance. And in Paris, when all these other men, as my curator friend mentioned, all these other men came here, fought, they went back to whatever careers they had. But Lafayette did not really have a career to reprise, and instead he really turned America into not just his career, but his identity. America became the very center of who he was. So what I'm showing you here on the right-hand side, so this is a little fudge, but it's, 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 it's pretty close. I hope you'll forgive me. It's not, the, it's not the house that Lafayette bought in 1784, which no longer stands. It's the house that was built next door to that one by the same developer on the same plan in the same year. So it's more or less the same house. Um, and as what you can see is it's a quite lovely place, but it's nothing compared to the Hotel de Noailles. Um, it's, it's a much more modest abode. And I'm also showing you here in the map, on the left, you see, on the upper left, this is where the Hotel de Noailles was in the first arrondissement near the Louvre, near the Tuileries. Lafayette's home is on the lower right in an area that in this mid-century, mid-18th century map was still largely undeveloped. There's a lot of haystacks in, the, in that picture. Um, so Lafayette essentially creates this new home for himself in this sort of new, sort of uncharted, still developing part of Paris. And in this home, he really turns this home into a seat of all things American. Um, in his uh, study, which is the room that you can see like, right off the terrace that, with, the, with the double doors uh, on the second floor, um, in his study, he hangs a Declaration of Independence engraved in gold. Um, 
he plants on his terrace, and he returns to the U.S. in 1784 for a visit. He comes back with, um, with plants from the New World, which he has planted on his terrace. He comes back, actually, with a young Native American man um, who serves as a favored servant. So his home becomes a center of all things American. And regularly, he has Jefferson and Adams and Franklin and later Governor Morris and any of the other visiting Americans become regular visitors to Lafayette's home. And Cornell University at the library there, they actually have these um, invitation cards that he had engraved in English that say, you are in the, Mar the Marquis and Marquise de Lafayette invite you to dinner on Monday the blank um, for, for, for dinner. And, um, and these American dinners, apparently the language of choice was English, and we're told by the, me by the uh, memoirs and letters written by all the Americans who went that Lafayette's children entertained the, the, entertained the guests with American songs. And his children were named um, George Washington Lafayette, Sorry. Yes, his son was named George Washington Lafayette. Um, his daughter was named uh, Virginia Lafayette and Virginie. But when she was born, uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote him uh, a little quip that he, that he, Franklin, was so proud of that he then had it placed in all the French papers where he said that he hoped that the Lafayettes would have 13 children so they could name one. <laughs> they could name, well, you get it. Could, anyway. Um, so, okay, so Lafayette, um, Lafayette becomes, uh, and, and just to summarize how closely affiliated with, um, with America Lafayette was, the American explorer John Ledger wrote um, that Lafayette has um, planted a tree in America and sits under its shade at Versailles. So he, um, he, was, he really had made America into his identity. Um, and so it made sense that when France started moving towards its own revolution, it, it seemed logical that Lafayette would be the person who would become the French Washington, who would be the person who would be able to lead his country to a new era of freedom and liberty. Um, and at first, this seemed possible. And so I'm showing you, just, this is just one of the more optimistic images from 1789, showing Lafayette helping France and slaying the hydra of despotism. Um, and in, on July 14, 1789, when the Bastille was stormed in Paris, um, it was to Lafayette that the city of Paris turned. And Lafayette, on the morning of the 15th, was named the commander of what became known as the French National Guard. Um, and what I'm showing you here is just two objects depicting, re related to the storming of the Bastille. On the left is just a painting of it. Both of these are objects that were made in multiples. Lafayette owned versions of them. The one on the right is just one of my favorite objects of all time. It's in the Musée Carnavalet, and we know Lafayette owned one of these. It's a sculpture of the Bastille made from a stone of the Bastille um, by someone who is liberated from the Bastille. Um, who sort of made, there, as you can see, there are a lot of stones available. So, um, <laughs> so this fellow sort of generated a lot of these sculptures and sold them all throughout France, and we know that Lafayette owned one. So Lafayette was placed in command, and he believed that he was helping France to move towards a constitutional monarchy. And this is what Thomas Jefferson also believed. Um, Jefferson actually wrote to Lafayette and said, if you're looking for a new constitution for your country, you can do no better than to look across the channel. So this was something that people just imagined was going to happen. France was not going to have a republic. Nobody thought that at the time, or maybe there were five people who did. Um, but really, for the most part, the constitutional monarchy was what was expected. Um, but events quickly spiraled out of control. So what I'm showing you here is an image from 1789 as well, depicting one of the, um, one of the first crises that Lafayette had to deal with. It was the morning of October 5th, 1789, um, and shortly before dawn, uh, market women, women who you know, worked as sellers of fish and, and other staples, um, were growing very, very frustrated because they couldn't feed their families. As I'm sure you know, France had had terrible harvests and uh, people were starving, the price of bread was exorbitant, and market women started showing up at um, Lafayette's office, basically, which was City Hall, and they were bringing weapons. They were bringing any weapons they could find. They were bringing cannon, they were bringing scythes, they were bringing knives, they were bringing pikes, whatever they could find. And they were joined uh, within hours. The, ma the, the crowd grew and they were joined by their, um, by their brothers and their husbands and their cousins and their sons. And by the time Lafayette arrived at City Hall, um, the crowd was so numerous and the crowd was so insistent that they wanted to go to Versailles they didn't just want to go to Versailles, but they said they were going to go. They, they had no, they couldn't, 
They had no bread for their families, they said. So they were going to go to Versailles and they were going to bring back the baker and his wife, meaning, meaning the king and the queen. And by the time Lafayette arrived, um, the National Guard had basically agreed that they were going to go with the crowd. So Lafayette had really no choice. And he went along with the crowd to Versailles, a rainy, pouring night, muddy roads, hours and hours of a uh, trek to Versailles. By the time Lafayette arrived, the heads of two royal bodyguards were already making their way back, separate from the bodies of those royal bodyguards. Um, but Lafayette managed to broker a deal. And he said um, on that day, he basically promised the king and queen that if they would come back to Paris with him, that he would protect them. Now this, of course, again, he was young, he was naive, he was optimistic. It actually proved to be a promise that he could not keep. But he nonetheless brought them back with him to the Tuileries Palace. Now on that day, he really lost the faith of those who supported the absolute monarchy. So just to give you a sense of, of the a flavor of the kinds of reception that Lafayette got, um, one newspaper from the time uh, from October of 1789, a monarchist newspaper wrote, why citizens have Lafayette and the leaders of the commune left you wanting for bread? Imbecile residents of Paris, these villains think that you have too much life in you. And then the author went on to say that anyone would be a fool to believe that their lives were more secure, quote, in the hands of the traitor Lafayette, the scoundrel, this vampire, than in those of your good king. So Lafayette in October 1789 really lost the support of the monarchists. He retained the support of the people for another year, actually almost another two years. Um, what I'm showing you here on the left hand, on the left hand side is um, a painting of Lafayette's moment of greatest triumph, 1790. It was a festival of feder federation on the Champ de Mars in Paris, where the Eiffel Tower stands today. And um, Lafayette led the nation, swearing an oath of allegiance to the nation, the law, and the king, um, assuming that, and he imagined that this was the pinnacle, the end of the revolution, that they were going to have the constitutional monarchy, and it was all going to be done. Um, on the right-hand side, though, you see a little caricature uh, suggesting that Lafayette shines only among the people. The implication was that he was sort of fomenting these events of whatever kind for his own glory. Um, and for a while, Lafayette persisted as, being, as a hero of the people. But that only lasted one more year. And on July 17th of 1791, just one year later, same place, Champ de Mars, um, the monarchy, uh, the king and queen had attempted to flee the country. They had been brought back ignominiously to Paris. And um, on July 17th, there was a group gathered on the Champ de Mars uh, jostling to sign a petition declaring the monarchy abdicated. A riot broke out. A um, martial law was declared. Lafayette's National Guard were patrolling the perimeter. What exactly happened, we don't know exactly, precisely, but what we do know is that um, rocks were thrown, shots were fired, and anywhere between eight and 100 people were killed. We still don't know to this day. And the blame was placed squarely on the shoulders of Lafayette because he was in command of the National Guard who opened fire on the people. So uh, on that day, he absolutely lost the faith of the people. And so one, um, one journalist who is on the, on the radical side uh, said, wrote of Lafayette that he saw, quote, nothing but the most dangerous enemy of liberty in you, in whom we placed all of our confidence and who should have been liberty's strongest supporter. Um, so Lafayette was preceded then to become really lambasted in word and image by members of every possible political stripe. And this is the image that I think sums it up. It says, it's probably from 1791, it's called Lafayette treated as he deserves by the Democrats and the aristocrats, which is to say that the people who wanted, at this point, people who wanted a republic and the people who wanted an absolute monarchy agreed on nothing at all except they both wanted Lafayette dead. And that was the one thing on which they would potentially collaborate. Um, so finally, in 1792, with the monarchy abolished and the radical Robespierre ascendant, um, a warrant went out for Lafayette's arrest. And had he not fled across the Belgian border on August 19th of 1792, he would surely have been executed as an enemy of the revolution. As it was, he was turned over to Austrian authorities and he was held for treason as an enemy of the king. So just to clarify, he fled the country because he would have been arrested as an enemy of the revolution and he was instead arrested in Belgium as an enemy of the king because he was blamed for having started this whole thing to begin with. 
So he was kept in prison for five years, returned to France in 1799, returned to French politics, but really never regained the popularity that he had had in France. But in America, things were different. Um, he returned to the United States for a triumphal tour in 1824-25. It was in that period, 13 to 14 months he was here, went to every state in the Union, feted everywhere he went. There were balls, there were theatrical performances, fireworks, musical celebrations, parades, dancing in the streets. You name it, it, w it happened. And it was in this period that every place, not every place, but most of the places that are named Lafayette were named Lafayette. Lafayette College was named at this time, for example. Um, and what I'm showing you here is just some of the items of material culture that we have. Again, every museum and historical society in this country has these things because they were sold at every price point. Um, on the upper right is an image uh, of a plate that was actually made in England, a transferware plate made in England for sale in the American market depicting Lafayette, the tomb of Washington. Um, on the lower left is... Um, Whenever women went to the balls and events, they saved whatever they wore, and they gave them to historical societies. And you can see that this woman um, wore a, a glove, a white glove, with a portrait of Lafayette on it. And she carried, um, she carried a fan that also had a portrait of Lafayette on it. Um, Lafayette College has, uh, I was there not too long ago, they have these little pink um, leather baby shoes uh, with Lafayette's face on them that were sold at this time. I've seen at the New York Historical Society, I saw um, a bread dish that when you baked your bread in it, if, when you turned it out, it came out with the word Lafayette across it. Um, so Lafayette was a tremendous celebrity here, and he was hailed not only for what he had done for the American Revolution, but also 1824-25, we were about to celebrate our 50th anniversary of the, of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And Lafayette was one of the last able-bodied living members of that generation who could go out and about and be celebrated. Um, and so he was. So um, when Lafayette died in 1834 in the United States, we observed a national day of mourning. But in Paris, he was actually barely missed. And we have a letter from a visiting American named Isaiah Townsend from Albany. And he wrote to his mother that, quote, a month has scarcely elapsed since the death of the general. Yet in Paris, his memory would seem almost forgotten. And so it was that in 1917, when Lafayette's chateau <clears throat> was sort of really fall falling on, on bad times, it was a group of Americans who purchased it to restore it, Chavagnac, and they decided that they were going to make it into a French Mount Vernon, which was very, very apt. Um, I, I just want to, you'll note that I'm showing you a different angle um, than you saw at the start of Chavagnac. That's because what I showed you originally was, um, was Chavagnac as it looked in Lafayette's time. This turret was actually added by the Americans who thought it made it look more medieval. They didn't think it looked sufficiently medieval at the time. Um, and, and so even today, it's uh, an American flag that flies over Lafayette's grave. And as you can see uh, on the left, that the grave was restored by the Benjamin Franklin chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, so. So little does France still love Lafayette that the monumental critical dictionary of the French Revolution uh, from 1988 states flatly that, quote, the man has drawn few eulogies. Now, that's patently untrue. They might not like him, but he's actually drawn quite a number of eulogies. Uh, John Quincy Adams famously gave a three-hour eulogy um, and he didn't even like Lafayette, actually, personally. He disliked him, but it didn't matter because Lafayette had come so fully to embody the idea of French-American friendship without which we would not have won the war that it didn't matter whether you liked him personally or not, that he was someone who everybody eulogized all the time. So finally, to end where we began with my curator friend with this question, why should we have a bust of Lafayette? It, what I've discovered in my research is that actually it's not because he was an unsullied hero. He was not. He was a human being. He took on some of the most challenging issues of his time. He stuck to his principles until they were all that he had left. And when he failed, his memory was denigrated really terribly. I mean, I showed you the PG rated images only. Um, there are some images that are very much not PG from the era of the French Revolution. When he, when he failed, he was absolutely denigrated, his name slandered for, for centuries to come in his own country. But when he succeeded, he earned eternal gratitude. And the bus stands as just one of those very small markers that we have of the debt that we owe to him. So thank you. <laughs>
Do we have time for questions? I think we, I think we have, thank you. I think we have a little bit of time if anybody has any questions. Yes, sir. With the hearty laugh in the front. Yes. <laughs> and, and hearty appreciation for your scholarship. Thank you. It's wonderful. I look forward to the book. I hope you enjoy um, it. I'm just back from Provence. Oh, welcome. And, um, <laughs> therefore, I've got to ask about the language. Clearly, when he, Lafayette, came to America, his English couldn't have been too good. It wasn't. So, he, he did not start, so a couple of things. He did not start studying English until he was on the ship coming over here. Um, <laughs> now, he's seasick. seasick. He was seasick most of the time and studying English. I don't know if they had any connection to each other, but he, um, but he actually had a flair for languages, and um, Latin was actually his best subject in school. He excelled at Latin. Um, but when he got here, he also, he had, you know, I don't know, I mean, I speak, obviously I speak French, um, but I'm always, as you can tell from Laura's story, I'm always afraid I'm going to make a mistake in just like, in general in life, and so because of, <laughs> and so because of that, I'm often hesitant to sort of try out my French, which is terrible because you don't actually learn that way. Lafayette had no hesitation, <laughs> and he actually had no problem, you know, speaking in English, writing in English, joking in English, even if it wasn't perfect English, it didn't bother him. You know, he did, however, originally when he first came, he did work with interpreters. In fact. Early on, um, Alexander Hamilton was one of his interpreters because Alexander Hamilton spoke French fluently, um, because which is a whole long story. But um, but and they were quite good friends, and they were both in Washington's entourage, and they were both about the same age. They were very young, and um, but Lafayette really did pick up English very very quickly. But it's an excellent question. Yes, sir. They definitely complement each other. Um, the one issue with, and, and these two came, descended through his family. The, the, the manuscripts that are here also descended through his family. Um, so what I'm about to say is that the family letters are always sort of expurgated. Um, and, but, and that's true of both the, I think, of both the manuscript collection and of the published volume. The published volume more expurgated than others. Um, what I found personally to be most useful and most interesting, the, the, vo the volumes that were published are, are letters. And um, what I personally found most useful in these collections were actually the things that are not letters, but things like receipts. Um, so things like um, uh, letters that are not to anybody important, but are to, like from his wife, to the architect who's renovating the chateau. These were the kinds of things that for me are letters to and from random American farmers with whom he exchanged plows. Um, these kinds of things to me are the details that brought him to life um, in, as, a, as a human being and, um, and in ways that, that the, the letters that are published in those volumes don't. Also, this, um, this collection also contains letters and other things by the rest of his family. So one of the things I remember being really struck by that I just, I really remember vividly um, was his, um, a letter from his wife when she expected that she was going to be executed. And she had every reason to expect because her mother, sister, and mother-in-law were all, um, were mother, sister, and grandmother were all executed during the French Revolution. And so the collection here has her wills. Her, she rewrote her will several times. And letters that she wrote to her son, this is one of the most moving things, the letter that she wrote to her son when she fully expected that she would be executed, telling him not to lose his faith in God. Um, other things like the other letters, when I say receipts, things like um, the Library of Congress has receipts for thousands and thousands of books that Lafayette purchased and books that he sold, and we know how he kept them organized in his library. Now, just because you purchased a book doesn't mean that you read it. I mean, I know this from my own experience. <laughs> um, but it does at least tell us what visitors to his library would have seen when they came. Um, or it tells us what books he thought he should buy for whatever reason, even if he didn't read them. So those are the kinds of things that are not published anywhere. And again, I think that's where, you know, Laura mentioned my background in visual and material culture. I think that these kinds of visual material culture things, one of the other things, I still haven't quite figured it out, but one of the things that has struck me the most 
Um, it just, I don't know why. It's just like these little things that you come across. Um, was shortly before he fled the country, he had every lock in his house changed. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's right. I think that's right. And that's the other thing about his debts, for example. Those are some of the more humorous things in this collection. Um, you know, we have, there's a myth that Lafayette went broke because of the American Revolution. That's not entirely true. He went broke partly because he lived beyond his means. Um, like a lot of other 18th century French nobility, and because that was what you did. I mean, there was a there was a whole elaborate system of credit, and there was a notion that you know, if you in order to be perform our, or to perform nobility, you couldn't be caring about pinching pennies. And we have this wonderful letter, which is in this. Um, so they have his account books. This wonderful letter from his. Uh, basically from his household accountant, who says to him, you know, Monsieur, um, in order to arrive at that happy state where when a man dies, he has something to leave to his children, <laughs> um, <laughs> you really must cut back on your expenses. And what we find is that Lafayette's own household expenses dwarf the expenses of the rest of his household. He's spending money on all kinds of things. So yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, you look like you were going to say something, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Because one was not supposed to concern oneself with these with these matters. And Lafayette did not. <laughs> He also spent a great deal of money in the French Revolution. That's exactly right. And then he lost everything in the French Revolution because when he fled the country, he was, he was declared in, in, in exile and emigre. That's correct. That's exactly right. And actually, his wife was very instrumental in getting most of it back, as far as I can see. She was the one who really, I think, had a good sort of business sense. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Managed to. We need to go move on to some other questions, please. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. There was a lady in the back. Thank you for that. There's a lady in the back, I think. Did you have your hand raised or did I make that up? I made that up. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Yes, he was. Lafayette was, um, had been elected to the second estate. So we're talking about the Estates General, um, which, which was called by the king in an attempt, in, in an attempt to, how do I put this, um, in an attempt to sort of uh, start moving the country. There was a financial crisis. And, um, and they were trying to figure out sort of what they were going, how they're going to move forward, where they're going to levy new taxes, for example, how they're going to balance the budget. Lafayette was elected by the nobility. Um, and was representing the nobility. Now, he had a dilemma, which actually, this is very complicated, but Jefferson actually wrote to him about this. Uh, Lafayette had a dilemma, which is that there was a, a big issue uh, ab about how they were going to vote. There were three estates. There were the nobility, the clergy, and the third estate. <laughs> and the third estate was everybody else, basically. 
Um, so the vast majority of the people. Um, what you're referring to, I think, might be the fact that at a certain there had been a, a tradition where you vote by a state. So in other words, the nobility and the clergy would each get one vote and the people would get one vote. In other words, then, right, so, right, so the, <laughs> so the, the people, therefore, would always be outvoted by the nobility and the clergy, even though they were largely, so there was a movement afoot that they should vote um, by, by, by person, not by, not by a state. Lafayette had been given orders by the nobility um, where, who elected him saying that he should vote by a state. He wrote to Jefferson and said he didn't know what to do. Jefferson wrote back to him and said, I think that you should go with the people because your heart is with the people, your orders are against the people, and, um, and although the people will accept you at a later date, they'll do so only sort of skeptically, and you actually should go over now, and he, he didn't. Where was he that day? He was not at the tennis court. He was not part of the tennis court oath. He was not part of that. He, 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 he definitely, he dragged his feet on that. And the French population held that against him? Yes. Okay. That's very good reason. Yeah, we, we had, uh, in this country, for the first probably 30 years of the Republic, a pretty um, significant debate about whether we should be more allied with the French or yeah. whether we should be closer to the, the English. Yep. How did the... Mark, how does Lafayette and the image of Lafayette play into this political debate? It's a really interesting question. So Lafayette, of course, always believed that we should be more closely allied with the French. Um, <laughs> um, but what's interesting is that even those even those who, Federalists and others who, who actually believe that we should be more closely allied with the English, they, they exempted Lafayette from that. Um, so that they would, they would always, you would actually, it was, it's really interesting actually, because you would see in the, it, I, as one does, I read the newspapers from the 1790s, <laughs> um, and, um, and you can actually see that, that they sometimes will gang up on each other if they feel as though somebody has slandered Lafayette, uh, in the, uh, among the, among the anti-French, uh, statements, if there hasn't been an exemption made for Lafayette, somebody will write in and say, but you, what about Lafayette? And say, oh, sorry, right, no, he's fine. So, um, so, in, in, in fact, during the, um, during, uh, the, when the Quasi War was sort of starting, so when France and the United States were on the brink of going to war, it never happened, but things weren't going so well between France and the United States in the late 1790s, it's a good way to put it. Um, and um, Lafayette had just been released from prison. And he actually wanted nothing more than to come to the United States. And he wrote to Washington and said, you know, I'm coming to the United States. I want a passport. Washington did not want him to come. Um, and in fact, um, Washington and the others uh, in, uh, in power at the time actively told Lafayette, we, we don't want you here, because they thought that he would actually exacerbate matters between, um, between the French and the United States, that they just didn't want to get involved. But Lafayette said, no, no, I can help, I can help. And they were like, no, we've seen your help before. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Don't, don't come. But it's actually, it was actually really tragic. In reading those letters, it's, it's, it's kind of a really moving story, because he actually wants nothing better than to come here, and he's writing to all of his friends, having them search out um, land uh, near Mount Vernon, having them search out land near Albany, near any place where he knows anybody. And he writes to his wife and says, um, if I have to take a hot air balloon, hot air balloons are all the rage, if I have to take a hot air balloon, I'm going to get to America. And the Americans don't, will not give him a passport. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I was wondering, what was his relationship? Not very good. Um, <laughs> so, um, so he returned to France sort of against Napoleon's better judgment. Well, sort of without Napoleon's knowledge, really. In 1799, he took the opportunity of Napoleon's coup d'etat while things were a bit chaotic to slip back into the country. And then his wife ends up brokering a deal with Napoleon. His wife is, the, is really the level-headed character in this whole story. Um, his wife ends up brokering a, brokering a deal with Napoleon in which he's allowed to remain in France, Lafayette is, but he has to stay at Lagrange. He can't come within 30 miles of Paris. Um, and so for 15 years, he ends up really living largely in political retirement at Lagrange. Um, he does um, 
during the Hundred Days, he actually ends up on Napoleon's side briefly, um, which is a long and complicated story. But he, won he, he defends Napoleon against what he sees as the incursions of the rest of Europe on France. But for the most part, he's very anti-Napoleon and Napoleon very anti-him. So they're sort of mutual in that respect. Just one more question. There's a lady over here. Yes, with a period dog, by the way. Yes, a King Charles Spaniel. <laughs> <laughs> They got along better than you might think. I mean, he had affairs as one did, um, as one did in that period, and this was fine by her apparently. Um, and um, but they actually apparently she was very very devoted to him. And in fact, when she was in uh, when he was in prison, I actually firmly believe that she uh, did more to get him out than anybody else because what she did was after she was released from prison, after her family was executed, after the reign of terror ended and there was no more um, sort of price on her head, she arrives at the door of his prison with her two daughters and says, if you're going to keep my husband, you have to keep us too. So now the Austrian government finds itself in this rather awkward position. It's one thing if you're going to hold Lafayette as an enemy of the monarchy, but now you're holding three innocent women. And um, Madame de Lafayette really made the most of this, and this became a cause celeb throughout the world. So um, there, were even, uh, there were even speeches on the floor of the House of Parliament um, arguing that the Austrians should release Lafayette and his family because it was such an injustice that she and her daughters were being held there. She, in fact, really never recovered from the illnesses that she, um, that she uh, contracted while in prison. She died uh, much, much earlier than he did, uh, about 10 years after they got out of prison. She, she became very ill in prison and she never recovered. Uh, he was very, I mean, he owed a great deal to her, I think, and she was, she was extremely devoted. Thank so you. thank you. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.